this one aligned to that one, and then they have to lie again to get around that, and then they maybe tell another one or two. But I'd like to read a few verses to you, especially one through five, the 27th chapter of the book of Genesis. It has to do with Isaac and Rebekah, and later on you would get into Jacob and Esau and all the things that took place there, and a lot of years went by. It says, It came to pass that when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his eldest son, and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here am I. And he said, Behold now, I am old, I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver and thy bow, and go out into the field and take me some venison and make me savory meat such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless thee before I die. And Rebekah heard when Isaac spake to Esau, his son, and Esau went to the field to hunt for venison and to bring it. You know, when I read that, I thought, well, Isaac is old and Isaac is about ready to die. And then I thought, well, now if I read that and if I use that scripture tonight, people think I'm getting too old and I'm about ready to die and I'm trying to pass that on as a, a thing. I'm not planning on dying. I would ha like for my life to go on maybe as it was with Isaac. After I read this scripture, I found that Isaac lived 43 years after this occasion. And that was a surprise to me. I always assumed that Isaac was old and about ready to die and, and things like that. And his eyes were dim and, and all of that. But I was surprised this evening when I found out that he was 137 years old when he said this. And then he lived 43 more years and he died being 180 years old. So you never know what you're going to find in the Bible. Just because you read it one time, you think you know what was there, but you don't. So that's what happened. We find then that Isaac was sent out to get the venison. And his mother, Rebecca, heard what Isaac had said to Esau. So she devises a little trick. Now I want you to notice this. This is a mother teaching her son to lie and deceiving the father. And this just goes on and on if you look into it. So it's no new thing today to find people doing these things. They've been taught evidently down through the years. So uh, as we find that Esau went out into the field to get the venison, the mother devised a device and she tells Jacob, you go out and get two kid goats. You bring them in and I will make this savory meat for your father. You can take it to him and then you will have the blessing that Esau is supposed to be getting. Well, he said, I better not do that because Esau is a hairy man. And my father will notice the difference. And she says, you do what I say, so to speak. So he went and he got the two kid goats, brought them in. And when they had killed them and all, she took the fur or leather, the coat, the skins, you might say, from the goat, put on his hands put some on his neck, and she found some clothes there that belonged to Isaac, which evidently, not Isaac, Esau, after she found his clothes and evidently had a little odor to them enough that you could detect whose clothes they were, so she put those clothes on Jacob, she put the skins on his hands, on his neck, fixed the meat, told him to take it to his father, and he did. So now that's the second lie, so to speak. So he went to his father and he said uh, something about to rise up and eat and he had brought him the venison. Isaac asked him, how did you get this so soon? Now again, I run into a little thought here. How did you get this so soon? It evidently hadn't been all that much time since he had said it, but enough time for Jacob and Rebecca to take care of the situation. Well, he said that the Lord had delivered it to him. So there's another little lie, indirectly. So he said, uh, you have the voice of Jacob. But you know, I, I, somehow or other, you're supposed to be Esau, but you have the voice of Jacob. So he told him to come over closer to him, and I think he might have felt his hands and convinced himself that it was maybe Esau. And then he could smell, of course, the clothes and all, and 
And he, he believed it. He was talking to Esau, so he blessed Esau. But again, the mother putting him up to it, thinking it out for him, deceiving her own husband, teaching her children to lie, robbing the other children of what he was intentionally supposed to have, or at least what the father wanted him to have. Now, wouldn't that be something to find out in a family, just one family today of about four people? Well, you don't know what goes on in a family of four people. You know that? I mean, when you get maybe a boy, a girl, or a husband and wife, and uh, each one of them are working for their own advantage, just put it that way. Wasn't they working more or less for their own advantage? I think they were. So whenever you get all that going, you can have all kinds of little things coming up, coming up. And I found that after Jacob had... Um, finally got there and, and got away after he had, Esau had ate the meat then Esau comes in and Isaac asked who, who are you and he said that he was I, he was Esau his eldest son he had brought him the meat well he knew right then there was something wrong but he realized that he had smelled the smell of the clothes he realized he had felt the fur and all of that the hair thinking that he was um, doing what he said now you know I, I got to thinking of this again and you can always think deep in the Bible if you'll just let your mind do it first of all it seemed like Isaac allowed his senses to overcome his hearing he heard the voice of Jacob he knew that was the voice of Jacob but he allowed other people's words to deceive him by the smell first of all by the feeling of the hair and all of that so you can see first of all you don't allow your senses more or less to take over what you know to be right and of course that can happen I suppose to a lot of people but this Esau got angry with Jacob and in his heart he said that he would kill him somehow the word got back and it doesn't say how but the word came back to Rebekah and she tells Jacob what had happened. So Jacob probably had began to fear for his life because he said he was going to kill him. Rebecca told him how that they could get around that also. She said, you go to our, my brother's house or whoever and go back there and you stay for a while until his anger is gone and then we will, you can come back and everything will be all right. He'll forget about it in a little bit of time. Now isn't that another thought? Just go away for a while, he'll forget about it, and then you can come back and pick up and go with some more deceit and all of that. So that's uh, pretty well what happened. They, uh, they got on down the line a little farther, and, and Rebecca probably leading him on and leading him on. But I noticed that Esau was supposed to not take a wife of the Canaanite people. Isaac didn't want that. So I guess it had been told to the boys, both of them but to be spiteful. Now again, that enters in. The spitefulness of Esau, he went out and took a wife of the people that his dad didn't want him to take just to be spiteful. So you can see how this works in family. I mean, if you didn't know people, this Bible would be kind of blank. But if you know people and follow the Bible and follow the people, people you know a lot, you can just go on and on with these kind of things. But um, after he was gone a while, he went to his uncle's house I believe it would have been and he found there the girl which apparently he married later which was Rachel wasn't it but he also found Leah and you find a deceit in that family as well now can you imagine all of this I mean I, I really was amazed when I got involved in all of this and studying it out so Jacob he was a deceiver as well but his mother had trained him in that you might wonder how was he so good at it well he had been trained in that from a kid so to speak so he was um, on the same side. He, and years went by. That's what amazed me. All the years went by that those two men had taken wives, they had raised families, and Isaac was still living. So that's what got me to thinking, how old did Isaac live to be if he was 137 years old here, and his eyes were dim, and he thought he was going to die, and making preparations to die, and all of that. And here he's living on, and the families are multiplying, and grew into men, evidently. Jacob's boys must have grown pretty well into men before Isaac finally did die. But we can't, um, we can't change that part of the Bible. That's just history. And I suppose, you know, the word, 
I believe the scripture says all scripture is given to inspiration. I believe this scripture was put in the Bible for us to see so we can understand what goes on in homes where we don't see what's going on. You know, I used to take little kids, and I used to, I really amazed at the things that I could do. We'd take one of them little kids home from church, and they would tell you everything that went on in their family's home in the last week or two. All you had to do is just, just listen. And they would tell it truthfully, as well as they knew it. They told it truthfully. They didn't plot. They didn't plan. They didn't make up things to fit in the, the betweens. But we kind of caught on to that. And that was early when I was started pastoring. So I learned. All you have to do is have an open ear, and you can find out about all you need to know. All you have to do is be ready and listen for it. So if we go a little farther into that scripture, I, there, there was so much of it, and I know I don't want to really get involved with it. It said Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father had blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. Evidently, I, Esau thought that his father was ready to die as well. All of this kind of woke me up as, when I got to reading about it. And it says, These words of Esau, her elder son, were told to Rebekah. And she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said unto him, Behold, thy brother Esau is touching thee, as touching thee doth comfort himself, proposing to kill thee. Now here's a woman knows that her one son is proposing to kill the other one. How do you think they got that far along in life anyhow? It seems like they was not taught too well, were they? Well, we would have to take, and I could believe I could take the Bible and go along and show you where they were taught the right way in a lot of things. But we are not trying to do that tonight. We're just trying to get out all of these little lies that the family members told to each other, all the deceit that was in there, everything that they'd done just to more or less promote theirself. And I notice it says here, when they talked of Jacob, it was her son. When they talked of Esau, it was Isaac's son. You know, you wonder, but I guess that's just the way families do, aren't they? I mean, if the wife gives the attention to one, maybe the father gives attention to the other one, and sooner or later in the eyes of people, well, this is her son, this is his son, and all of that. But that, that's the way this went on. But this is what she said. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice, and arise, and flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. See how quick she was to find a way to get herself out of all of that? So it just kept going on and on. We could uh, just dig up and dig up a lot of these things. It says, And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Panaram, and to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's, and Esau's mother. And he went there. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob, and sent him away to Panaram to take him a wife from thence, and that as the blessing, as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Now, I think that had already been said a couple other times in the Bible as well, but whenever it come down to the time that Jacob was going to leave, but, you know, there's some deceit in this as well. She had made Isaac believe that she was sending him there to get a wife. And all she was doing was sending him away to keep Esau from killing him. So this just gets bigger and bigger. And isn't that what lies does sometimes? You can just start and you just keep making lies fill in and fill in and fill in. And I don't know if this was in Bible study the other night or not. Somewhere I heard this, it kind of amazed me. But they said if you tell a lie, you have to remember what it is so you can uh, tell it over and over again. Was that you? I heard that someplace. But they said it's easy to tell the truth, you know. It's all already in your mind. It's already settled, so to speak. But if you tell a lie, then you've got to remember that lie so you can tell the same one over and over again. So I guess whoever said that probably knew some of what they were talking about. A little practice makes you better than anything. But this went on, and, you know, Jacob went down. He got to his first, well, he worked at seven years for the first wife. He didn't get her. He had to work another seven years for the second wife. And he got her. Then he stayed and he worked, I believe, another six years. All of this is adding time, and Isaac is still alive, I believe. So uh, I was amazed just to see how this all turned around. 
I don't know where I wanted to go to. I'm not going to go very far because I think you people probably already found out all that I know here about that this evening. Um, I was going to find where he said how old he was. If you'll bear with me just a couple seconds. I should have looked a little sooner. Anyhow, it'll tell us where, the, if we could just find it there, that he was a hundred and four score years old when he died, and his sons buried him. And Isaac gave up the ghost and died, and was gathered unto his people, being old and full of days. And his son Esau and Jacob buried him, but someplace else it tells us that he was a hundred and four score years old. So you take my word for that. You'll find it in the Bible someplace. But a lot of ten chapters of Bible went by while us is all pondering and, and everything. And I wondered myself, you know, we used to study an awful lot on Wednesday night in Ohio. And we would study and we get on these kind of things. And I think we did remember a lot. But there's a lot in there that you still don't get. That's why our Bible study could be so profitable if we get more people and dig out these things and one present their part to the other so we could all learn from it. But all of this took place through a period of, well, let's say roughly, what, 60 years possibly? I believe Isaac was 40 years old when he went and took the first wife, and that wife. So if he was 40 and died at 180, he had a wife apparently all of those years. But we'll, uh, we'll leave this little bit with you, which is not very much. But I just couldn't get away from all of this thing. These people aligned to one another in their family and just keep building it up. But, you know, I, I've been around a few families like that after I got to thinking about it. I've actually been around a few that this one would lie a little, and, of course, they kind of get a division going, and these two or three will lie with these two or three, and they just keep things going. And, and I think it's a shame, really. It's bad when people in the same family can't go on without lying to one another. Now, I think sometimes we do maybe alter this truth a little. We say things maybe that could have been maybe explained a little more definite. But this is planning. This is premeditated the way this went about. And I guess that's where things really can get into to deeper situations. Uh, misspeaking sometimes. You know, I, I, I heard different preachers sometimes say uh, the wrong name for the wrong person. Well, that's no big thing. You know who they were trying to say. 